Hey guys, Frank Cox here. I'm super excited. It's Friday night and I'm actually home this time. Anyway, happy hour is beginning in the Midwest anyway, right now. It's five o'clock and I'm super excited for tonight's show. Um, a good friend of mine, Roy Elkins, is going to join us today. And, uh, you know, th there's this mythical creature that exists out there that, you know, typically I've never met one in real life. So that's why I'm saying mythical creature, but there's actually guys out there that repair broken welders. And that's who he is. He's a welder repair technician with a boatload of experience. And I'm super excited to have this conversation because I'm sure he's going to help me understand some things that maybe I don't already know about. So anyway, we're going to play the old intro here and we'll be right back in just a second. Roy, I am so glad that you was able to join us tonight. Uh, I don't know if you heard my intro there, but I called you a mythical creature. <laughs> I've been a lot of things, Frank. What's that? <laughs> I've been a lot of things. There Not you go. <laughs> yeah, so we we always have trouble with our machines, and you know we of course blame the manufacturer and all of this kind of stuff. And I bet typically it has nothing to do with the manufacturer. There's probably a lot more to do with us. And I'm excited to hear what your input on some of that is. But real quick, I'm going to introduce you to the folks. Um, this fella right here is Roy Elkins, and he is with Baker's Gas. And uh, true story, he uh, he's a drum cooker guy, and that's how I know him. And uh, he's got some other cooking utensils around. And uh, one day I was having some trouble with uh, one of my machines, and he jumped in the old chat there and got a hold of me in my DMs and said, hey, by the way, just so you know, I'm a welder repair technician. And then I was just like blown away that they exist. So uh, anyway... Tell us a little bit about yourself there, Roy, and, and kind of your your story about how you got into all of this. Uh, basically, I'm just a welder repair tech. I, I used to work on cars for a living way back in the day and started working on welders about 30 years ago. Um, worked on uh, gas drives, diesels, and propane-driven machines for 10 years of my first in my career, and then uh, moved on to the electric machines. So I've moved up from there. So been repairing welders for about 30 years now. Um, That's awesome. You see what I do for a living, I repair broken stuff. I can repair pretty much anything, but they pay me to repair, wel repair welders. Yeah, that's cool, man. So uh, one, once you, what made you make the switch from uh, auto body car, car related stuff to, uh, to this? Well, well, to tell you the truth, I had a friend that worked at a welding repair shop. And he would come home and he would ask me questions about engines he couldn't get running or stuff like that. So I would help him out with that stuff. And he goes, man, you need to come up here and get a job. I'm like, nah, I'm good where I'm at, you know. So time went on. And finally I did. I went, went up there and got a job. And pretty much that's how I got in the welding industry, just, uh, just for my knowledge of working on engines. And it just went from there. Gotcha. So uh, tell me a little bit about Baker's Gas. I mean, you search something on the Internet for welding and Baker's Gas comes up pretty darn high in the list. Uh, tell me about them. Baker's Gas is a unique company. We're, we're a small, big company. Uh, we have 10 locations. Uh, we're located in southeast Michigan, northern Ohio. Uh, we have a total of 10 stores. Um, all repairs come to my location. I do all repairs for all 10 stores. Um, wow. Number 10 store is a online store only. It's basically a warehouse where mm -hmm. if you go to bakersgas.com, that's where your stuff's going to come from. Uh, and cool. basically, it's just a warehouse that is full of welding stuff, machines, um, safety gear, you name it, we got it. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm going to put that down here in the chat. Um for you guys, Baker's Gas. There it is. Yeah, so uh, you guys are pretty much, you deal everything from what I understand. I mean, you there ain't nothing you don't have. No, sir. We are very, uh, we're a very different kind of welding company, actually. Uh, welding supplies is a big one, but we're also a gas supplier. So we, we have transports and we, we deliver oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, we deliver argon. We deliver, you know, CO2. 
So uh, we do that. We also are Baker's Propane. We have a large okay. propane company that we ship a lot of propane to people's houses. We also do commercial propane. Uh, we do temporary heat in the wintertime, which is a, a big business for us because we sell propane. Oh, uh, yeah. We also, provide, um, we also provide a, a fire extinguisher program. Uh, actually, my boss is one of his first projects was the fire extinguishers because he was a fireman. Mm-hmm. Um, and two of our stores, uh, the one that I work at and another one located in Jackson, Michigan, we actually have an Ace Hardware store located in our facility. You know, uh, I noticed that you, you'd sent me a hat. We, when you sent me those parts the other day, you sent me some hats and there was a hat in there that said Ace Hardware. And I was like, really? This is an Ace Hardware chain too. That's really cool. Yeah. And, uh, at our Ace Hardware store that I work at, um, we also have a large rental fleet. You can rent anything from a bulldozer to a weed whip. And, <laughs> and I do mean anything. That's so, awesome. So we also do that. So we, we stay very busy. That's cool. That's cool. So uh, you also cook some barbecue here and there. Uh, how long ago when did could, you start cooking? I wish I, I wish I could cook more barbecue than I do work on welders, but you know how that goes. <laughs> but yeah, I love, day. I love barbecue. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, so uh, tell me about your arsenal there. You got a, I know you got a drum cooker. Yeah, a drum it's cooker. A you got a draft master. That's a fine cooker. If anybody needs one, get it from Frank. He knows what he's doing. That sucker is 300 all day long. Um, <laughs> got a Weber kettle, of course. I got a, um, I got a uh, Holland, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, a little Holland grill gas grill. And I have a, uh, a drum, I'm sorry, a dome cooker. So mm-hmm. I have a little bit of everything, a flat top, a little bit of everything. That's cool. Yeah. So do you ever do any competitions or anything? Yes, sir. I've done some competitions. Uh, I like to do competitions, but it's tough finding a good team. It really is to find yeah. people to cook. Um, mm-hmm. but I could do it myself, but then I thought about it like, nah, it's too much work. It is so, a lot of work. <laughs> it, it really is. It really is, yes. Yeah, you just you just need somebody to at least somebody to run and help kind of keep control yeah, of the environment. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. But it's mm-hmm. comp- I, I, nowadays I do more. Uh, guys will bring me meat. I'll smoke it for them. Stuff like that. That's cool. That's cool. So into some stuff, guys. If you have questions, make sure and pop them down here in the chat. You have an you have a rare expert in the chat here that, uh, and I'm going to get into it and hear some stories, but. I mean, as far as like welders that aren't functioning correctly or issues you've been having, uh, let's kind of talk through some of that stuff. I, I know that Roy's got a lot of information that he can whoop down on us. And, and I've got my own questions for sure, too. Um, so as far as like, uh, you know, repair, like welders, like what's the most common failure that you hit that you see like if out you know there there's got to be one thing that you're like well dang it again seriously <laughs> truthfully lack of maintenance like everything else the lack of mm-hmm. maintenance you, you got to blow these machines out that's the biggest probably the biggest thing is especially on mig welders uh, or electric stick welders that fan sucking in air it's sucking in dirt yeah and grind dust and all that stuff so it's pretty much maintenance. Um, you got to keep everything tight. I mean, keep your leads tight. Keep all that stuff tight. Uh, anytime uh, something gets hot, it's loose. I mean, stuff shouldn't get hot. Ground yeah. clamps are probably the biggest downfall of most people because they think, well, it's, it looks good. It feels good. But if you grab that ground clamp and it's hot, it's, it's not right. Yeah, and it's it's not like a welding shop is a clean environment. It, 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 after mm-hmm. all, you know, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, it's sitting mm-hmm. right down there, getting the grinder dust blowed in it. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have yeah. some customers that the first thing I do when we get a machine in, take the sheet metal off, you put it out in the power wash area, and you power wash it out before you even touch it because it's got so wow. much, it's got so much crap in it. It's just I don't want that. It's just too much crap. Just power wash the sheet metal or the inside of the welder? The sheet metal. The sheet oh, metal wow. Metal. But yeah, power wash it out. It ain't going to hurt it. Power wash it out. Oh. Let it sit a day and then go ahead and work on it. That way you ain't Dang. working on that crap. Especially when you work on stuff from steel mills, places like that, concrete plants. 
man, there'll be an inch, two inches of that crap in the bottom of them. Gets in the contactors, it gets everywhere. Power yeah. wash them, set them aside, let them dry out. They'll be fine. Yeah. Even so, in, so, go, go ahead. ahead. Sorry. I'm going to say even inverters. Everybody's always scared to power wash inverters because, you know, there are all these electronic parts in there. Power wash it, blow it out, let it set for a day, fire it up. It'll be all right. Dang, that's intense. So so my background uh, in, in commercial refrigeration supermarket stuff, uh, you know, I wouldn't necessarily uh, do that on, on something like what I'm working on. But uh, I could see because I guess they do they do go an extra mile to protect some of those controls and stuff, you know, from the environment. Oh, yes. I mean, nowadays, not nowadays, the new PC boards are potted so much that you're not going to hurt them with a power washer at all. And I'm not saying get in there and blast it. You just want to get in there and clean that stuff out. So mm -hmm. Mainly because you ain't got to work in it. Yeah, yeah, you know, totally. A lot of the times, that's the only thing wrong with the machine. It just can't breathe. It's got so much crap in it. Because most wow. days, you know, days, fans are fan on demand. They only run when they get hot. Mm -hmm. So if you got a fan that won't run when it gets hot, it's going to shut down give you air code. You got to wash yeah. them. got to keep them clean. Yeah, that's that's good info. So as far as like uh, uh, machines go on the on the MIG welder end of things, because I know most of us are MIG welding kind of guys. Like, what what machine do you think is probably the most well built machine out there that you like? It's it's the easiest one. Is there one? Let's ask that. <laughs> I'm a Miller man. I, I like Miller um, for a lot of different reasons. I like the way they draw their wiring schematics. I can read them easier, um, but I've always been a Miller fan. Blue is my favorite color, but maybe that's got something to do with it. I don't know, but I, yeah. I, prefer, I prefer a Miller machine. Um, I have two Millers and a Lincoln in the garage right now, so I'm not opposed to a Lincoln. Um, mm -hmm. So I, my top two would be Miller Lincoln. Yeah, that's good. So, so do you think that one really outperforms the other? I mean, because you're the guy that's fixing it, so you ought to really be like up on that. No, sir. No, sir. There, there's not one machine made better than the other. No. Uh, if yeah. you're dealing with if you're dealing with top line machines, no. There's not any machine. A Miller, a Lincoln, and an Esop. I put that's in my top three. They're all made solid. I mean, they're all good machines. It's all personal preference. People come and ask me that all the time. And I always tell them, it's like Ford Chevy. It depends on what you prefer. Yeah. It, it boils down to color and looks and interface and those little things that really don't make that big a difference probably to how it runs. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yep. You cover it up. Yeah. I, tell you, I tell you a story. Back in the day when Miller first brought out inverters, um, you know, Lincoln always had the pipe welding uh industry wrapped up in pipe welding the sa 200 stuff like that they weld pipe all day long with those things they put an xmt 304 in a gray machine the guys were welding with it and they would say man this thing welds so great what is it and they showed it was miller they about cried <laughs> so they would put the miller guts inside the sheet metal for the yeah, S for the yeah, they would make it look like he was welding with the lincoln like sa 200 <laughs> and they would love the machine because they thought it was that Lincoln, but really it was the XMT 304 inside their welding mill. Oh my goodness! That, I never heard such a thing. That's hilarious. So uh, as as far as like uh, you know the smaller end of the machines, you know, um, you know as far as so if a guy's just welding quarter inch all day, and you know he's a smoker builder, so he's not he's not running that thing at a really high percentage. You know, he's he's just running it a little bit here and there. And, uh, you, you know, those kind of things. What what um, what what do you think about the smaller machines compared to like making that jump up into a bigger machine? Like, are they going to wear that thing out or anything? Is there any reason that you would recommend don't get a small machine? Yes, sir, because uh, a lot of people buy a machine that's too small for what they want to do. So mm -hmm. they're constantly running on the high side. So they're going for the maximum output of the machine. They say, well, it'll, it'll weld quarter inch. So, but they got it all turned all the way up. And they're just running the piss out of it all day long. Where if you stepped up to another, a little bigger machine, you're not running it wide open all day. Mm -hmm. If you want a race car, you don't buy a Volkswagen. So yeah. 
<laughs> buy something, buy something that you got. You don't have to run wide open. It's like you or I. If we work, if we work wide open all day long, we get real tired. But if we take yeah. the time all day long, we seem to last a little longer. But a bad, and, and the same goes with plasma cutters. People will buy that. They'll buy that plasma cutter that'll cut eighth inch. But mm-hmm. they're pushing it every day. They're pushing it hard every day. It won't last as long. Still you know, to- you, yeah, yeah. You, you know, that's that's something you bring up because uh, I, I bet you work on a lot of plasma cutters too. Can you kind of go in because I I have my own idea of what's happening there, but kind of go into that a little bit. How does them things like actually work? Well, they, they, they take air and they take air. They run it through your torch, and once the electrode and the nozzle separates, that creates the plasma that you're cutting with. So um, clean air in a plasma cutter is its lifeline. If you don't have clean air, your plasma is going to be crap. You're going to go through a lot of consumables. Consumables in a plasma cutter are not cheap. And you've got to keep the air clean. And, again, it goes back to ground it's like everything goes back to grounds, really. It really does. Um, yeah. But a plasma, there's I mean, there's a lot of different plasmas out there. My personal opinion, Hypertherm wrote the book on plasma cutters. Um, they hold two or three hundred patents on plasma cutters. They are the best when it comes to plasma cutters. Cool. So, so you say plasma, like, what is it, though? Is this just electrical <laughs> charge? Like... Yeah, the electricity that they put into the nozzle, and when it separates, it be, it, it, it creates plasma. So they're actually mm. burning, they're burning the air. Gotcha. That's what it is, and then they force it through a little hole with the air, thus you can cut. I'll be dang. So uh, okay, so when one of the concerns now, this is a frank concern that I've never put effort into figuring out. So. Everybody in the chat can laugh at me, but uh, all right. So whenever you are cutting a propane tank with a plasma cutter, because I've, I've had people ask me, aren't you scared about the oxygen coming through there with the compressed air? So when that, what is left over, what is the, what is the byproduct coming out of that with that torch? Is there compressed oxygen coming out that torch also that's unburnt? I'm going I'm I'm to say no. I could be wrong, but I'm going to say no. Okay. I don't think so either, because like to get that intense of a, like we're looking, we're looking for some force. And then we're looking at that, like you said, the plasma coming out of there, that's making the cut. I mean, I've never had any issues, so I never even worry about it. We just, we cut tanks with them for years. (laughs) I I, I don't, I mean, no, I, I, if it's there, it's going to get burned up. I mean, that plasma is hot. I I don't know what the temperature Mm -hmm. is. No, I I don't, no, I don't think so. It's kind of like asking, yeah, it's kind of like asking if there's unburned oxygen coming out of the oxy torch when you're done. You're just like, no, it's all burnt up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. Looks like we're getting some questions in here too. I want to make sure and grab them as we go here. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, here's here's a question here. He just bought a Lincoln 140 big pack. Dave did. Uh, and it's supposedly good for five sixteenths, but you're saying that's going to be at the top end of the duty cycle. It's going to be stretching its legs probably. Um, he's wanting to know if it'll work for uh, smoker building. So it would depend on the material. Is well, how thick uh, material? Yeah, is. yeah. I would I would say like if, if, as long as you're not like welding it all the time at that full, like you said, you know, at that full end of it. If you're doing, if you're doing, you know, ten foot run with that machine, you may want to stop and give it a rest. You know, yeah. maybe even bevel and make some multiple passes is what yeah. I would say. But, so, so Frank, I explain to people what a duty cycle is. A duty cycle is on a ten minute cycle. So if you run that machine, say, so say that machine is a forty percent duty cycle machine, you can run that machine wide open for four minutes, and then you must let it rest. If not, it's going to overheat. So that's basically what a duty cycle is. It's based on a 10 minute, 10 minute usage at wide open. Mm-hmm. But nowadays I've noticed that they have broke it down. They'll do a hundred percent or do like a 60%. So mm-hmm. you really got to watch your duty cycle, especially on the newer machines, because 
An old machine, you get an old machine hot, you just quit welding. It'll cool down and be all right. These newer machines, if you get them hot, you could damage some stuff and they'll never work again, never work right again. Mm -hmm. So, so is it just system wide that it damages, or is there one main component that fails? Whatever, whatever is doing rectification. So we get heat when we rectify AC to DC. That's where the heat mm -hmm. comes in. That's where the, we get a heat problem. There is when we rectify from AC to DC. Yeah, and that's in all that magical coil pack looking and stuff in there. Why, well, that's why <laughs> the, the heat sinks are made out of aluminum, so they dissipate the heat. So gotcha. that's where that's where your heat's going to happen. All your thermostats are either going to be inside your transformer or they're going to be on the rectifier plate itself because that's what's going to get hot when you're rectifying AC to DC. Gotcha. That's great. Uh, here's another question real quick here. Um, Richard, I have a titanium unlimited 200. Can you recommend a better and longer gun that will fit? Do you know that's the – I don't know. I think that's the Harbor Freight one. I'm not really too familiar with the mechanicals. I, I would have to know what ends on the gun. If I seen a picture of what end was on the gun, there's only, I don't know, four or five different ends out there. Um, typically those machines, they either like use it, use like the old Twinkle style or like the old Hobart style before Miller bought them out, which was a thin power pin. But I'd have to see the end of the gun to tell you that, but I'm sure there is a longer gun. Usually guns, on these smaller machines are anywhere from 10 to 12 foot. Um, mm -hmm. Excuse me. Uh, you can get up to a 25 foot for some machines. Wow. That's cool. Yeah. So there's a couple of companies I think that make the aftermarket ones. What is it like Profax and what's the other one? It's depending on the power pin though. That's where what we really got to look at is the power pin and how the trigger connection hooks up. That's mm -hmm. two things. That's only two things we got to worry about. The power pin cool. and how the trigger wire hooks up. And you could always cut and splice a trigger, trigger wire if you had to. I but was just about to ask that. <laughs> yeah, if you're just making a contact or closure, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I don't know much about those Vulcan machines. Have you ever worked on any of those? I can't say I've ever seen one, no, sir. Yeah, they're, they're kind of a, uh, well, I don't want to say a throwaway machine, but it is a Harbor Freight machine. And, uh, you know, I've never run one, but Bob has a couple down there that uh, somebody dropped off one one time or another. And, and he's run them through the races. And he says for, you know, for somebody that just has a, a garage welder, you know, that they they, uh, they do OK. You know, if you're not using it every day and stuff. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I would think that'd be fine for everyday repairs around the house. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So a uh, little bit about CO2 here. My brother, a a Ron, he wants to know if he can run CO2 when he's mobile. And I don't know what, uh, Aaron, if you could develop that question just a little bit to let me know what process you're doing. Bob says, give me a recipe. We'll let him <laughs> pop back in. <laughs> let me know what you're doing. So CO2, CO2 runs hotter than uh, 7525. Uh, a lot of people like to run CO2 because it's cheaper. But it it will the, the you will penetrate deeper in the weld with CO2. Um, if you run CO2 hard, it will freeze up. So they actually yeah. make heaters that go on your regulator to keep that from happening. Uh, they plug it into mm -hmm. 115 and they heat that CO2 up a little bit. Um, the advantage of CO2 is really just cost of shielding gas. Yeah. Well, and I think it's liquid in the bottle too, isn't it? And uh, so you get a lot more out of it. It's that's freezing up because it's changing state. I think in the regulator, you ran out of vapor. Um, at least that's what I've. What's that? You pull vapor. Well, you pull vapor off the head of the tank. Yes. So mm -hmm. if you once you once you get past that vapor, you're gonna start pulling gas. You are correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he was asking, Aaron just chimed back in again. He said, uh, when plasma cutting. CO2 for plasma. Mm -hmm. Don't recommend it. Yeah. I've never heard of it. So no, I was just curious. No, no. I mean, you can run compressed oxygen, mm -hmm. compressed air, but not CO2. No, sir. I don't believe, I don't believe you can run CO2 with a plasma cutter. Yeah, so you'd have to get like a, a, a moisture problem. 
be my biggest concern. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so whenever I was doing it, I just I either just had a comp- uh, generator and a small small compressor that would run enough air, or I would just you know have a gas air compressor, you know. But there again, if it's really humid outside, you can get into some moisture issues and stuff. Um, like like you said, you got to have good clean air. Um, yeah, I I've, so, I've had plasma cutters come in for repair, and I pull the trigger, and water squirts out the head of the torch oh my God. That's, not a good sign. that's something wrong so yeah i mean all plasma cutters most plasma cutters have a filter on the back of them but you should also have a oil and air separator before it gets to the machine yeah oil is another concern for sure um you we always uh what's that and you get that out of your compressor you know you'll get oil yeah. out of your compressor so that and if you get that in the consumables of a plasma cutter you're just wasting money on consumables. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know that, uh, you know, watching Tom up there run that plasma table he's got, I mean, it's always him versus the air. You know, we put crazy serpentine water separators in and, you know, helical ones and, you know, desiccant dryers and just all kinds of silliness just to try to get a little bit more consumable life. And right. uh, it's everything you can do to protect it. <laughs> It looks like to me, tell me what you think, but it looks like to me like when moisture does come through, the first thing it does is it ovals out that tip on the on the gun. Correct. And then the, and like if you look at your electrode, there's a little silver spot in the middle of the electrode. That's called hathium. And when that starts to deteriorate, your arc's going to deteriorate. But mm-hmm. uh, your nozzle, when you start to see your nozzle widen out, that's what your cut's going to look like. So you're not going to get mm-hmm. that nice fine cut you're looking for. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On uh, mechanized torches, it's a pain because <laughs> you're yeah. trying to get that real high quality cut. Yeah. I mean, and you got to keep in, keep in mind when you're plasma cutting, the faster you can cut, the cleaner the cut's going to be. So if mm-hmm. you take your time and mess around, you're going to have all that draws on the back of your cool. And you got to clean all yep. that up. But if you can get a nice, straight, fast cut, you'll get less of that draws. And that's Mm -hmm. um, that's really key in a plasma cut. Oh, yeah, for sure. See, make sure I got all these questions here. Yeah. So do you guys have a lot of equipment in stock up there? If guys are, like, looking for a certain machine? Yes, sir. Like I said, we have have one store that is dedicated. It's just a warehouse. That's all it is. We don't do Mm -hmm. no service there. The only thing we do is sell online orders out of that location. You know, that's something that drives me crazy is, uh, you know, you get to a lot of these smaller welding, local welding supplies, and it's like you go in there and every single thing you're looking for, they almost got what you need, but they don't have it. You know, inventory is so such a difficult thing these days. Um, I, I was look I was looking at the at Baker's gas page today and I saw, I mean, piles of welders. (laughs) I mean, some of them pictures, you guys got a big operation, it looks like. We roll. We, we, if you need it, we got it. That's super cool. Yeah. So here's another question here. Kevin's wanting to know about nitrogen when plasma cutting stainless. He's heard something about that, looks like. Allegedly, it cuts cleaner. It does touch. It will cut stainless cleaner. Yes, sir. Uh, Hmm. But doesn't work as well for mild steel. Not yeah, not for mild steel. So pretty much, so pretty much, it's the this. Is it the gas that goes through the nozzle that actually makes the plasma, or is it just the separation the, of those pieces? Uh, the the gas runs through a swirl ring in your torch. So what mm-hmm. that does is it swirls it. It gets that 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 uh, air or whatever you're using for a shielding gas swirling, and then when you pull the trigger. You get that swirl, and then when you pull the trigger, and that electrode and that nozzle separates. That's what creates the plasma. It ignites that gas that the swirl ring has swirled. Gotcha. So that's why um, air pressure on plasma cutters is critical. When it says set it at 80 psi, you should set it at 80 psi. If it's too mm-hmm. less, sometimes it won't fire. If it's too much, you won't get a good cut. So it's it's very critical that your air pressure is set properly. Oh, wow. That's cool. Good to know. Most plasma plasma cutters have a set option 
So turn the knob to set, the air will flow, and then that's why you want to set your regulator. Don't yeah. set it when it's just a set and they're doing it like, like you would for your MIG welder, but you want it flowing when you set it. Yeah, yeah. That's good to know. Um, yeah, I know that on the, the older uh, 45s, the uh, Hypertherm 45s, uh, when, not, the, not the new version that's got the automatic setting on it, but we that's what I always did. I turned it to that set position and it would flow continuously on air. Adjust right. your regulator on the back of the machine until you get it where you need it, and then you're right. dialed in. Correct. Yeah, Hypertherm's cool. Hyper got a little green green thing on there, and you put the needle between the green thing, and you're good to go. Yeah, I always love it when everything's either red or green because I'm colorblind and I freaking can't see any of it. <laughs> so I, I just got to guess it's in the middle. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, uh, so tell me a little bit more about like, uh, you know, on the on the Miller machines or the Lincoln machines, as far as like when you're cleaning those out, you said to power wash it out. Let's say that we're scared. What's another alternative? <laughs> just blow it out with air. Compress just take air. take air, just blow it out. Yeah, I blow out every machine that comes in the shop, regardless. It's it guarantees it'll get blown out. But if it's you know, like I say, if it comes from a steel mill or uh, you know, someplace like that, a power plant, it's going to the wash bay, it's getting washed out before I touch it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so whenever we're dealing with uh, what like guns and stuff, because I know there's probably a lot of guys in here that's had the liner blues in their MIG guns. I mean, I have changed out liners. It just doesn't make even any sense why these things fail. What causes those liners to fail other than kinking a, a gun, a hose? You know, so, like it just seems to wear out. Well, they don't really wear out. What happens is you get that dust and dirt from your shop is laying on top of your wire. So then you pull the trigger and you pull all that into your liner. Um to tell you the truth, Frank, nine times out of ten, it's probably not even the liner. It's probably your inlet guy that's stuck up with crap because that's what's going to catch it first. A lot of guys run the little felt pads on there and they put some cleaner on it. But truthfully, it's usually not the liner. It's usually the inlet guy. Um, I get machines in for repair, and the inlet guy is just jam-packed with crap, and you can't feed wire through that. So hmm. nine times out of ten – it's really in your inlet guy that pulls to the liner. Unless that liner gets kinked somehow, it's really hard to uh, really plug that liner up because, you know, most of us that run 035 wire, we're running 035, 45 liner. I mean, it's not going to get jammed up with stuff. It's the inlet guy that gets jammed up the most. So, and that inlet guide is whenever you flip up the, the wheel or whatever's on there, that's that brass cone looking fitting that's right there that the wire goes in yes sir when you come off the spool when you feed it through that first guy that you feed it through that's your inlet guide mm -hmm. then you got your drive wheels and you got an outlet guide and a lot gotcha. of times a lot of times uh it's uh drive roll alignment that's a problem also so if you look mm -hmm. down through there and that drive roll isn't lined up with your inlet and outlet guide that wire is riding on top of that drive roll. It's not getting down in that groove and feeding properly. Ah, gotcha. I never thought so, about that. So making sure that wheel is in the right spot is not offset. Sure look at it, eyeball it, make sure it's lined up. There's a screw uh, in the center of the drive motor. And behind that, behind the drive rolls are two spring washers. They're like wafer washers and they're spring, spring loaded kind of. So if you loosen that screw a little bit, that drive roll will come out a little bit or it'll go in, vice versa. Got to make sure them drive rolls are lined up properly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and you're basically saying adjusting it if it has to be adjusted on the shaft? Correct, yes. Yeah, where the shaft comes through the back of the machine. And so you got to take the sheet metal no, off no, to get to that. No, sir, no, sir. When you're looking oh. at, your, at your drive assembly, you're mm -hmm. looking at your drive assembly, you got a bottom drive roll and you have a top drive roll. Mm -hmm. When you flip it up, you get top drive roll. That bottom drive roll is connect is mounted on the motor, feed motor. Okay. Inside is either going to be an Allen head or a uh, Allen head or a Phillips screw. And mm -hmm. if you loosen that up, that drive roll will move out or it'll move in just a little bit for that spring. So that's how you got align it. it. Yeah. It's nothing. Yeah, I don't have to take sheet metal off or nothing. Just look at it. 
And if it's not lined up, you need to just make that a little adjust. And it might just be a little bit, but if that wire isn't laying down in that driver properly, it won't feed properly. Yes. So, so I've been welding since I was uh, 17 years old and I never, ever heard that. <laughs> So that's awesome to know. I can't tell you like how many problems that probably was an, an issue contributing to the overall, like we would have welders, man. I don't know. It just seemed like they just had a day that they worked and a day they didn't. And then you let them sit for a few days and then they come back, man. They just yeah. need a rest. I don't know what it is. I, I, it, I want to try that with one of the customers. Hey, it just needs to rest a little bit. It'd be all right. <laughs> so Tom and I, I think, over at his shop over there, like we had, shoot, we probably had seven or eight welders over there, you know, rolling around in different states of happiness. And uh, that's, that's pretty much what it was like. So, so we would put a liner in one, that thing run like a striped eight, man. I mean, for a little bit, or, uh, you know, we changed the wire in another one. And it was just like, you know, Bob always talks about the guy that makes scratch marks on the machine where the where the knob needs to be and but then you didn't take into account the humidity and the uh, outdoor temperature and the indoor temperature and the bubble point and the dew point you didn't take all this into consideration what the voltage was that day <laughs> you know yeah. so uh how much of an impact while we're talking about that how much of an impact does incoming voltage have to do like if we're on like in my building uh it's 208 high leg so it's three phase so we've got 240 or 230 you know at at the machine um well we choose 230 on that one but then we let's say we move it next door to another building that's got a y and it's 208 so so or 212 how big of an impact does that voltage difference make on incoming voltage for a machine uh standards 10 percent, give or take is what industry standards is um mm -hmm. i don't feel it uh it's a real big issue um, as long as you're within that 10%, you'll be fine. Cool. So whatever the machine calls for, if we're on the lower end of the machine and it's set at 208 incoming power, um, you know, 10% of that would be good. Yes. Sir. Plus or minus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. likewise, if you got it on, if you got 240 coming in and, uh, but the machine's got a tap for 230, uh, you know, you're probably all right. You're yeah. All right. Yeah. Run it. Cause, cool. because, uh, especially in bigger cities, I used to work in Detroit back in the day. And some days I couldn't even test machines because the power was so bad because you get all the people in Detroit, you know, fire their air conditioners up for the sun, hot summer weather. And my input power would be low, below 200. So I, I can't even fire a machine up. So, mm -hmm. and if you get, uh, if you, if you live in a, in a, uh, an area where you have a lot of, um, uh, factories around that are really sucking up a lot of power, you could see problems. Yeah. If yeah, I would imagine so. Because yeah. they're just they're sucking it all up. Mm -hmm. So so how much do you think the environment has to do with like humidity? Like if you're working in a sweaty old freaking shop and you know it's 80 or 100 percent humidity outside. <laughs> you know, or in the shop versus an air conditioned environment. How, how much of an effect do you think that has on the equipment? On the equipment, I don't feel it has much to do with the equipment. The welder itself, the guy has got the gun in his hand, has a lot of effect to him. Uh, he's too hot. He don't want to weld. The welder ain't welding right, boss. It ain't working. I don't feel it. <laughs> I don't feel that the machine itself sees that. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a person problem. It's a, well, it's a welder problem, yes, sir. Yeah, welder. Is it welder or welder? Weldy or whatever you want to call it. Weldy. <laughs> That's funny. Let's let's talk a little bit about some TIG welding stuff. So, do you did you work on a lot of the old Healy arcs, the L techs and stuff like that when that first came out? I've worked on some L techs, uh, mostly TIG machines, old Millers, old Lincolns, mostly. Uh, some of the old airco machines, uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah, uh, L -Tech, I haven't really seen a lot of LTEC machines. I mean, I've seen a few through the years, but not a whole lot. Yeah, we've we've got one of, or Tom does now. It's up in his shop. It's the uh, LTEC that's at two fifty HF. Um, ACDC's got the Heli Arc, you know, and 
Um, is Heliarc, I mean, basically it's the same as just uh, high frequency start on any other machine, isn't it? Or well, is it different? Well, a Heliarc is really just a form of, it's old school TIG welding, as people call it Heliarc. It was just mm -hmm. TIG, it's nothing different. Mm -hmm. They use high frequency. If you're welding mild steel or steel or stainless, you're going to use a high frequency start. It's going to drop out once you establish an arc. If you're welding aluminum, it's going to be continuous. Uh, mm. Now that will, the if you're running an aluminum TIG, humidity will cause you a problem because of the high frequency. Yeah. So, so what exactly is happening there on that, that to generate that, that, Heliarc, that electric start like that. So the reason I'm thinking about it is that LTEC, you take the cover off and you're welding, and it's literally like two points with lightning between them that's just sitting there humming and hissing. Yeah, yeah. So basically, a high frequency circuit is this. Uh, typically, it's a 115 supply. So they take that and they supply a, um, uh, a, um, oh, I'm drawing a blank now, a, um, they're, they're supplying a um, transformer. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so they put 115 in and they get real high voltage out. Don't ever put your meter on high freak to try to read it. Trust me, I know. It'll be gone. It'll, 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 smoke, it'll smoke your meter. <laughs> it'll, be, it'll be crazy. So they, they, put, they put 115 into it and then they get a high voltage out and they run it through a series of caps to smooth it out. And that's what you're seeing across your high freak points. Wow. Okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Don't don't check that with your meter. <laughs> no, no, do not do that. What happened when you did it? You uh, you'll take a five hundred dollar fluke uh, meter and it'll, it'll be done. It's don't try yeah. to. So it's probably uh, I think it's about sixty thousand volts. Mm -hmm. Real high yeah, voltage. It's a bunch. Real high voltage, low amperage, but the voltage yeah. is pretty high. But yeah, they take that's they cool. take that and they run through some caps to smooth it out, and that's what well, that's what you use for high frequency. And they do that. The reason they use high frequency on stainless or mild steel is to establish the arc without tung uh, contaminating your tungsten, so you don't have to touch the work, so you don't contaminate it. Yep. Uh, in AC welding, they use it for the same purpose, but they also use the AC to clean the material uh, to draw the impurities out of aluminum. Sometimes you get aluminum that's junk and it has a lot of crap in it. So you really mm. got to pull it out. Yeah. I've only welded aluminum a couple of times. And man, I tell you what, that's that's uh, a lot of power going on right there at one spot. Mm. Well, it, the aluminum uh, aluminum sucks up so much heat. So you really yeah. got to sock it with heat to get it up to that melting point. And once you start welding, uh, once you start uh, TIG welding, Mm -hmm. uh, aluminum, when you start to see the surface mirror, when you see it mirror, it's ready. But if it ain't mirror, cool. it's ready to go. Some of the yeah. best tube welders I've seen are women. Yeah, women, I've heard that. They just they just can TIG weld well. I mean, they can. They mm -hmm. really can. TIG cool. welding, welding, especially aluminum, to me is an art. It really mm -hmm. is. It's tough. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did okay. I'd only did it a couple of times. It was just practice. I, I wasn't making anything. But, uh, man, you got to really put a lot of a lot of care into what your, your surface prep, your material prep. You got to have a clean environment. There's <laughs> a yeah. lot going on. Aluminum is finicky, yes, sir. Yeah. So as, as far as, like, uh, lift start TIG, um, how, how does that work as, as far as like, how was that arc established? I mean, we're, we're going to touch the, the tungsten to the material, lift it up. And that's where you're talking about the contamination of the tungsten because it might pull a little material up onto the tungsten, I guess. But Correct. like, is it just, is it just like that gap that when we lift that up, that's letting that arc start? So when you, so when you go to try to start, start an arc, you have your gas flow. So you're, your, your flow is uh, shielded from the atmosphere. And then when we start it, we short it out and we lift it, it starts and it, it stays in that cone of the uh, mm -hmm. shielded gas, mm -hmm. basically. Yeah, that's cool. 
So, so getting back in, guys, if you got any questions, feel free to jo- drop them down there in the chat, even if it's about your own welder and issues you're having. But I really wanted to talk about grounding and stuff like that. Um, as far as like different methods of grounding, uh, is there is there one method that you prefer over others for guys to use? Like, say we're working at a bench, uh, you know, like a clamp, or should we use one of those magnets? Or what what do you think is the best? For that. Also, I feel the best is an actual ground clamp. And uh, what a lot of people do is um, they'll be welding on something and their ground clamp will be five foot down from the project. So now the current <laughs> is from the ground clamp all the way up to your electrode. You should always keep your ground close as you can to where you're welding. Um, your ground mm-hmm. should be clean. It should be tight. Um, the magnets, they work well. But I think a good old fashioned ground clamp is the best. Mm-hmm. So, so a lot of the times, I think Jackson makes the best ground clamp. My personal, I think personally, that's good. Is that that big brass one, yep. brass looking one, that yes. big hard to squeeze one? Yeah, squeeze that's the one I like. Because, yeah, because it happens through time when the ground, when you have a poor ground, the ground gets hot, the spring gets hot, and once that spring gets hot, it loses the tension. So then you know, you have a bad ground. Gotcha. You're not squeezing as hard that way. So, so as far as like, uh, keeping your, your clamp, uh, closer to wherever you're working, like you're saying, like just freaking unhook it and move it up within a couple feet of wherever you're at every time. Yes. Yes. I, I'd move it yeah. a couple in because it's, it's yeah. like, you're right there. You're so if you, if your ground clamps five foot down, you're, you're, your currents travel all the way down through that work to get to your electro. Where if you move that clamp closer, there it is. Yeah. Cause it's completion of the circuit for the machine that matters, right? Correct. How, yeah. Yeah. That's what's going to get you the best performance. So, because yeah. I know that like sometimes we would just set a flat piece of steel on the, on the floor. We would just have a good tab kind of turned up and we, clamp it there and then we'd weld the whole cooker that way <laughs> and it would get moody it's not wrong but if you want to do it properly you should keep your clamp close mm-hmm. yeah that's good to know so uh as far as like connectors because i know there's these kind that you can hit and and tighten down on your wire when you're connecting uh different kinds of fittings together like i'm thinking about the eyelet where you connect to the machine Yes, you sir. know, like what what kind of connectors and stuff should we be looking at? Because if you put a bolt in, a lot of times it pushes the frayed out wires away, it seems. Is there any tips on like connecting? So you're talking like uh, to, on, on the end of your welding lead, your connector goes into the machine? The machine, talking? yeah. Mm-hmm. Like the uh, LC40s. LC40 is probably the, the most common. Um, well, mm-hmm. what a lot of people do when they uh, replace those ends, um, like if you buy a Jackson LC40, it comes with uh, a couple of things. It comes with an Allen head and it comes with a strip of copper. Well, that mm-hmm. strip of copper is not supposed to go in your scrap bin. You're supposed to wrap that around the end of the cable. Stick that <laughs> in there. And then when you put that set screw in, instead of all them wires fraying apart, they're wrapped up. They're going to get a better connection. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, I know that uh, those twisty ones, the ones that you like put in the machine and twist. Yeah, uh, right. I had a couple of those that, that uh, the tab wore down and I had to replace those. And there was one that I got a hold of. I think, I don't remember where I got it. If it was, uh, but anyway, it's a mechanical fitting that, that like tightens down over the, you shove the wire in there. And then there's like a collet almost that tightens down around the wire. I don't know if you, have you ever had to replace any of those? I don't believe I've ever seen that kind. You talk about on your okay. ground or welding lead. Yeah, so like on an ESOB, when you've got, you can move fittings around and it's got that little tab that, like it's a tang that sticks off the side of the brass. They, you they call stick that, it in. They call that, a, it. it's called a DENS, DENS connector. Okay. Yeah, they call mm-hmm. those a DENS connector. But I don't ever think I've ever seen one that was mechanical. I've always seen them that were just with a set screw and you just tighten them down. Oh, maybe that is what it was. I'm starting to think back. I think it was a set screw. It was like uh, Profax, like a, I think, maybe made yeah, the connector. Yeah, like a 5 30 second Allen head in it that you would tighten up and tighten down. 
slide your boot back over and you put a little flat screw in to hold the boot in place. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know what? Now that you say it, I think that is what it was. I don't know what I was thinking with the twist part, but, uh, but yeah. So as far as like gun tips and stuff like that, like we're talking about uh, the consumables, we wind up chasing contact tips, things like that. Um, you know, you see some of these sprays that are coming out to, to keep your, your gun clean. Then you got nozzle dip and BB butter. Like what are your tips on some of that kind of stuff? Get you a pair of whelpers and clean your nozzle out and uh, go on with the day. That's my personal yeah. thing. Because you spray that stuff and you dip it and it's all over the, everything. To me, it's just it's just a mess. It really It's just anti-splatter so the splatter doesn't stick to the nozzle. Where if you would take mm -hmm. two seconds and just pull the nozzle off with a pair of whelpers and just clean it out and put it back on, you'd be mm -hmm. all right. You save yourself a couple of dollars in nozzle dip. Uh, I'm not a yeah. person... But I'm not a welder. I don't weld every day. So that's just my personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. So the what I've always found is that I get the whelpers, you know, and I use them for cutting my wire off, but I'm not even thinking about the nozzle. So I just throw them back on the bench and I start welding again. For Before too long, I'm looking down in the end of the nozzle when I start getting a little bit of porosity, you know, and uh, it's shot, man. So uh, if you look at your whelpers, it's actually a – it's got, it's got a lot of tools on it. So a whelper, you take your whelpers, like I said, and you take that the pointy end, put it down on a nozzle and twist it. It'll clean all that slag mm -hmm. out of it for you. It's also mm -hmm. got a little place to loosen your tips up. Most people never tighten their tips up. They take it, they put it on their finger, and they tighten it up. It's wrong. Your arc transfer takes place at the tip. You need to, mm -hmm. be, need to be tight. You need to buy the proper tips for your gun. A lot of people go to these places, they buy tips, and it's not even the tip for the gun. They got a Miller machine, a Tweco gun, so they go to the store and they say, what kind of machine you got? Well, I got a Miller. So they give them Miller tips. Well, they take them home and they jam them down in a Tweco gun. It's not the same thread. It ain't going to work. It'll work. It gotcha. will, but it ain't right. Um, also, make tips wear out. I can't tell you how many times I got a machine for, for repair. That's running 035, and you could run 064 wire through the tip. <laughs> Continue to use that same tip, but that's where your arc transfer takes place is at that tip. It's not as critical in MIG welding, uh, uh, mild steel, but if you start doing a lot of aluminum MIG welding, especially like a mm -hmm. spool gun, and you get a tip wore out, you'll pull your hair out trying to figure out what's wrong, and that tip is the problem. So, so what is the problem? What wears out? Is it just ovaling out the hole? Correct. I mean, when you yeah. when like when you put a new tip on there, you run O thirty five wire. If you look at it, it's tight. I mean, it's it's a tight fit. Once it wallers out, you're not getting that good arc transfer that you used to get mm -hmm. before. Yeah, and and so is that is that the uh, the arc transfer coming through the liner and all of that stuff up into the contact tip? The, the liner, the only liner only feeds wire. It's all the liner does. Your MIG gun has copper in it. Cable. That, copper cable that's attached to the power pin that goes into your drive rolls. The current mm -hmm. actually flows through that cable, not the liner. So okay. the, all the liner does is feed wire and allow the shielding gas to pass through. Mm -hmm. So uh, the actual arc is, the actual current is going through this, the copper in the gun. Gotcha. Yeah. And and then one thing I do want to point out is on the spray master guns, I think for the ESOB machines, it's got that tip that drops in and then you get the, 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 the nozzle that tightens down. Don't stick the whelpers in too far. <laughs> That's a bad deal because yeah. it'll like wear that thing out and then the tip doesn't stay in. The diffuser. You know? Yeah. The diffuser. Yeah. So, so. at the end of your mid gun, excuse me, you have a diffuser, an insulator, a nozzle and a tip. Those are the components at the end of a MIG gun. Uh, the diffuser usually never goes bad until you burn it up or it gets jammed up with slag, which that happens a lot. Then you, you get poor gas coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what have you ever like, so what's happening with that insulator is it's keeping the, the, the nozzle or whatever the, what is, what is that? Is it called the nozzle? Okay. I've always called it the nozzle. I just want to make sure I was right. So 
the nozzle uh, winds up like if you ever get in a situation, your nozzle sticks to the material. That means your insulator is bad, right? Correct. Correct. You're getting <laughs> wet into the nozzle that you shouldn't. You should be able to lay the nozzle on your work and it should never arc. That's you know, really, the nozzle really is just there to uh, force the gas into your load. Yeah. Really you, you know, it's it's one of those things that most people never even think about. So I hate that I'm I'm sorry if I'm asking too simple of questions. No, but sure there's a lot of newbies out there that that just don't know. You know, I, I see it all the time. Yeah, the time. I I seen a guy throw a gun one time just because that nozzle kept sticking. You know, and I'm like, dude, you got to change the consumables. You know, right. exactly. Yeah, and don't and don't throw the gun down every time you're done. Just don't drop it. Like right. put it in a place where it won't fall off, you mm -hmm. know, like mm -hmm. clean all your drinks and shit off the firebox <laughs> and like, let's find something to actually anchor your gun so you can set it down. <laughs> right. That's why so, a, lot of, a lot of them have hooks on them so you can hang them up. Yep. Yep. That's cool. I tell you what, Roy, I've had a blast talking to you, man. I, I hope that everybody found this helpful. Um, I'd look forward to having you on again. I really want to have you and Andrew come down to the shop and uh, just hang out with us at one of these welding classes. I think that would be a ball. Um, yeah, be good. Have a big event. Yeah. Yes. So tell everybody how they can get a hold of you. If, I mean, do you guys, do they let you guys ship what, do they let us ship welders to you to work on and stuff? If we have issues, like well, how does it work? Sure. If you want to drop something in the mail or ship it to me, I've, I've got machines from Florida. I've got machines from all over the country, you know, um, Usually it's my uh, 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 like Aesop rep or my Miller rep. They're having problems somewhere and they say, oh, I know a guy can fix it. They'll send it to me and, and we'll look at it and we'll fix it. But yeah, you can drop ship anything to uh, bakersgas.com. You can find us on the line. And I've, I fix, uh, I'm a certified Miller, Lincoln, Aesop, Hypertherm, all your major brands. I do all warranty work for all of those brands. Um, and I work on, like I say, I work on any other brand too. It doesn't really matter to me. Mm -hmm. but the, that's, the that's great. Yeah. So even old machines, right? If we got an old yellow, prefer, old brown. I prefer old machines to tell you the truth. <laughs> I, I like to work on older machines better than I do new machines. Yeah. Yeah. What My about like machine? Lindy? Lindy. Have you ever worked that, on a Lindy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I know be, a guy that's. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I keep cutting you off. Back in the day, used to be your Union Carbide. Oh. Lending Union Carbide. That's way back. But, yeah, there used to be a green and yellow machine. Mm -hmm. but yeah, I think I've worked on machines from the 50s. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So, But I prefer yeah. the machines like the old SA200s were always fun to work on. Um, I've done some work on, like, stud welders, like 2,000-amp stud welders that have, like, a big GMC diesel in them. Um, I've, I've worked on pretty much everything out there one time or another. That's cool. That's cool. Well, right on brother. I super appreciate you being on tonight on such short notice. Uh, I know I just hollered at you last night. <laughs> I've been traveling a lot for the barbecue stuff, but, uh, anyway, uh, guys, if you need anything at all, check out bakersgas.com. They're a big old outfit and they got a Roy. And that's important. So <laughs> anyway, appreciate you, brother. Guys, till next time, uh, keep your smoke thin blue. And we'll see you next Friday night. Take Have care. A great one. Bye. Yeah.